evening, everyone. I'm just going to get started uh, now. Uh, so just once again, good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we conclude the Ahmed Katrada Foundation's Anti-Racism Week 2024 program. My name is Ratabile Ratsomo, and I am the Anti-Racism Program Manager at the Ahmed Katrada Foundation. In 2024, uh, we will be seeing numerous countries across the globe scheduled to host significant elections, marking pivotal moments in their democratic processes. As South Africans, we have often seen how racism and xenophobia poses a significant threat to the integrity of elections and democracies worldwide, manifesting often in various forms that undermine the principles of equality and inclusivity. The primary object of this objective of this webinar is to foster understanding, to foster awareness and understanding of the heightened risks of discrimination that often accompany election periods. By examining real world examples and discussing the underlying dynamics, we hope to equip participants with insights and strategies to counteract discrimination, misinformation and disinformation whilst upholding, upholding the principles of equality during crucial political events. Once again, thank you to all who have joined. I'd like to begin with um, introducing um, the Amakathrata Foundation's Executive Director, Mr. Nishan Bolton, who will facilitate the remainder of the program. Thank you so much to everyone. Thanks, uh, Reta Bile, and greetings to everybody. Um, as Reta Bile says, my, my, my name is uh, Nishan Bolton. I'm the executive director at the Qatar Foundation. And we want to just extend our appreciation to everybody who's here uh, in, in, in person, as well as those who are linking up via Facebook and whatever other platforms they are. Um, I think the the timing of of this session, you know, couldn't be better. We are less than ninety odd days to to, to the elections, um, and already the temperature gauge around elections is, uh, is, is 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 shooting up by the day. What we hope not to see is what this what this the, the focus of our session is today. Is issues are uh, issues of discrimination, racism, uh, and perhaps inequality uh, in 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 how we do our campaigning work, how we execute the elections, um, and and that's really what the focus is that that of of, of today's session. We have a, a powerful panel here. Um, let me introduce them and welcome them uh, in no particular order. Janet Love, uh, so happy that Janet is now being reappointed um, in, in, in the nick of time. Uh, many, many people here will know Janet as the anti-apartheid activist, um, doing all kinds of stuff for the ANC as well, I'm involved in CODESA, a member of parliament, uh, ministerial water advisor. And the one thing I didn't know, Janet, was the stint at the Reserve Bank. Uh, and somewhere along the line, the, it also served as a human rights commissioner and now an electoral commission. I'm not sure if there's any part of, of, of government and commissions that you have not served in. Uh, but we are just happy that you are in, in the IEC today to help guide it through what will probably be one of the most exciting and if one of not the most contentious elections that we've had to date. I'm not sure if Shaka Histop is here, uh, but Shaka should be joining us. Uh, besides having is an executive MBA in mechanical engineering, uh, a major soccer league represented Trinidad and Tobago at international level, um, with the recipient of the English Professional Football Association Special Merit Award for his services to the game, um, and is a founding member and patron, an honorary president of the anti racism organization Show Racism the Red Card, which is probably one of probably the biggest anti-racism organization across the UK today. 
our third uh, member here is Tristan uh, uh, Abrams. Tristan uh, LLB and honors in English, Perth University. Uh, previously worked at the Kathrada Foundation, and now uh, working at the Legal Resource Center. Also, as serves as the, the the secretary or general secretary of the Defend Our Democracy movement. And our final panelist here today, Zakira Vadi. Uh, Zakira um, currently heads up the Defend Our Democracy movement, worked at the Kathrada Foundation, um, and is a journalist by trade. Uh, and, and, and has a BA honors as well, I think, uh, if, if masters, if I'm not too sure. Um, not masters, been, no. Not masters, no. okay, but that's just a hint as to where you need to be going to. <laughs> so, so welcome to all of you. Um, you know, I, I, perhaps the timing of, of this session has not been the most appropriate. People are breaking fast. And when I know we're talking about discrimination, Zakira will say we've been extremely discriminatory in terms of denying her, of taking away from her eating time uh, and soon to be praying time as well. So, but Zakira, we will keep this short and by seven, seven o'clock we will be done. So I, I just want to pose a, a set of questions to, to, to each one of you and, and to Janet in particular, to kick off with, in terms of the the IC, wh where do you see issues of discrimination, bias, uh, creeping in to 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 the electoral process and any one of the areas of work between now and 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 the the, the election day, and and what are the kind of warnings and signals that that you would want to alert us to? That, that this conversation and a wider conversation needs to be aware of. Welcome, Janet. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Sean, and, and thanks for um, setting this up. Um, look, there, there are various risks. I kind of probably would um, divide them into three kinds of risks. The first would probably be a risk of discrimination um, which arises from dissemination of information, including disinformation, and the ways in which that can have huge influence. But it's information about the electoral process um, so that people understand what is going to happen, that they understand the role of different people in the voting station, including party agents and observers, what can be expected, you know, and so on. I think there's also then an important need for people to understand what constitutes electoral abuse, what is intimidation, what's allowed and what's not allowed in voting stations, what does vote buying mean, and, you know, how does one, how does one um, categorize that. And then there's also very importantly, I think, for particularly in this election, is information as opposed to disinformation, but also comprehensive information about the contestants, whether they're parties or independent candidates, and what their proposals are all about. So there's a whole lot of discrimination in terms of access to information, distorted information, and therefore how people can engage that information that could raise um, possibilities of, of discrimination. Clearly the biggest um, and I suppose most dangerous threat is the, the discrimination that kind of comes across through the demagogues um, of our electoral process, the sort of racial um, uh, mobilization the gender discrimination that is um, very often um, rears its head, particularly through vehicles such as social media, and also discrimination and quite um, uh, um, problematic um, uh, statements that deal with people who are perceived um, as, as being foreign, whether they're internal migrants or people 
coming from out of the country and a whole lot of mobilization about that. So that's a huge set of discrimination risks. And then lastly, I would say that there's discrimination risks that are purely in relation to access. You know, racism is part of our legacy and um, we haven't really overcome that in, in so many different ways. And we see that in terms of access, for example, to data and information, but we also see that in terms of the ways in which disability um, and inclusion need to be dealt with. So, you know, there are a number of things for the commission that we have to do in terms of dealing with that. Maybe, I, you know, I, I, those would be my three kind of top sets of risks in terms of discrimination. Thanks, Janet, and I'll come back to you in terms of how the commission uh, is, would be responding to some of them. Zakira Vadi from Defend Our Democracy, where do you see the discriminatory risks in relation to the elections? Well, I think we need to look at South Africa's historical experience. So one, we do come from a racialized past. And that means our electoral politics was severely racialized. So prior to democracy, black people could not vote. Uh, there was complete disenfranchisement. Um, and that's that's the context in which we, we, I think, have hosted the 1994 election. So there's been significant progress. But in the last 30 years of democracy, and especially more recently, we have seen examples of what Janet has alluded to in terms of racial mobilization by political parties, um, if not racial mobilization, then perhaps mobilization in a very nationalistic, almost xenophobic way. So I've looked at a couple of examples more recently. If you look at um, Action SA, they have in the, uh, on their website indicated that, and I quote them, we will address illegal immigration through intergovernmental relations, etc. But at the same time, if government fails, they will look at dealing with undocumented foreign nationals uh, through lobbying additional grant funding and then delegating such power to municipalities. So they're trying to state this in a very legalistic way, uh, in a way that won't necessarily contravene the, the constitution. But in practice, what does this mean? Does it mean, for example, going to the borders as, uh, as some from Action SA have done and pushing back uh, migrants that are trying to come through the borders? Um, does it mean spurring on groups like Operation Tudula, for example, that have already uh, indicated or last year registered to be a political party? I'm not too sure what, what's their status at the moment. So I think the, the impact of the statements of political leaders is going to be quite important in, the, in this election in terms of perhaps creating an atmosphere in which others may want to then pursue further discrimination. Um, other examples that I've looked at more recently, uh, if you look at struggle songs, uh, Dubla Ibuno, for instance, and the kind of uh, meaning that may have in democracy, and there's lots of debate around it, but I think it's the way in which it's used um, by the EFF statements that some may interpret as being anti-white or anti-Indian, um, that's in the last couple of years. And then you have, um, you know, parties that are mobilizing on the base of race, not against, so they're not trying to create uh, any sort of, um, you know, discrimination against another race, but perhaps are promoting one particular race. So if you look at the PA, for instance, and their mobilization of um, what what would de be deemed as colored people in this country, um, that, that's something I think to look out for in this election. But others will also look at mobilization based on religion. You have political parties, a Muslim political party, a Christian political party. Late last year, there was talk of a Hindu political party being set up. And again, that's mobilizing on a particular um, on a particular issue. And for me, there's a very fine line between championing certain causes um, and then being populist and putting forward a, a kind of rhetoric that seeks to other um, different different groupings of people. And this is important in South Africa. I think we've seen over the last few years instances of violence and how easily we are able to um, witness instability in the country. So the July 2021 insurrection that took place, 
Um, and in, in a community like Phoenix, for instance, you see how those racial narratives play out in tandem with violence that takes place. And when you have a political party like the DA that came in at that particular time and said, um, they put up a poster saying um, the ANC calls you racist, but we call you heroes. It plays into those racial narratives once again. So for me, political parties, and it's really the duty of political leadership in this country to refrain from racialized narratives. And ultimately, um, you know, I was looking at international examples. If you look at Cameroon, there the, the kind of divide is around Anglophone and Francophone lines. Um, and we've seen how political parties play that up in a pre-election period and the kind of instability that um, that that became of that country in the lead up to one of its election periods, simply based on issues of language that then went down to ethnicity. And South Africa really does need to guard against this sort of thing, I think, on, on all levels of or all particular barriers, whether it be race, ethnicity, religion, et cetera. Thanks, Akira. Christian, I'm going to, to bring you in. Um, and, and just to say, we, we've had a very late apology from Shaka Islop. Uh, so he's not going to feature here, and we won't have his insights uh, in terms of the, the work that they do and its possible impact on elections in, in, in that part of the world. But just from the work that you've been doing, Kristen, um, wh where do you see the kinds of uh, danger spots uh, for the forthcoming elections in relation to the work that you've been doing and the systems that that that, that the LRC have been looking at and the comparative studies across the world. Thanks, Sean. So I, I think from, from the work that we've been doing, we really see the risks of discrimination and <clears throat> and of um you know incitement of violence and hate speech and um all of, and even disinformation being proliferated on social media platforms. Um, and what we've been looking at is the ways in which social media platforms guard against those things happening. Um, so there's there's two things that I, I plan to speak on and maybe I'll just go through quickly. Uh, but the one is the, the way in which social media platforms designs um, are, are really geared toward a business model that profits off um, the, the proliferation of hate speech and of disinformation on the platform. And so at, at its most basic, uh, social media platforms make or ad tech platforms make their money from paid adverti advertising, which is targeted at users. But that only works to the extent that users are actually engaging and present on platforms. And the design, especially of Facebook and, and, and in general of all ad tech platforms, the design is so that it it is almost addictive. It is addictive in its nature. Um, and and content that, that contains hate speech or disinformation um, is actually uh, being proved to, to boost addictiveness on the platform. And so they rely on that sort of speech to be, uh, that sort of content to be proliferated um, so, that, so that people continue engaging on the platforms and then can, can be targeted with, with specific advertising. The second thing is through the content moderation. And, and just to say that all of these, these social media platforms have policies which talk to content moderation, which speak about hate speech, which talk about misinformation. And all of these policies um, contain mechanisms to, to, to curb the spread of those things. But it's the enforcement of these policies that's really an issue. And it's, it's something that we've been exploring through different investigations that we've done. Um, one investigation we did was, um, was using content that was targeted at migrants and refugees in the country and really contain the most hateful language toward them. Um, and we submitted these adverts without them ever being posted. So with, with the platforms, you can submit adverts for verification and you can schedule their posting for two weeks in advance. Um, so, so they never actually really get posted. But with adverts, they go through a process of verification and then only can you actually, um, you know, you pay and, and, and you have them go out. And all of the, the hateful, um, vitriolic content that we had created was all approved by these social media platforms. And, and this, um, that content we, we tested on YouTube, on Facebook, and on TikTok. 
we did a second round uh, which then contained content that was targeting female journalists. And for both of these investigations, we took examples from social media, real life examples. And so for the second one, we used, um, we used content that was targeted against Gabriel Hafferty, some also I think against um, Nicole, at, uh, Nicole Fritz at some point. And, and we used that to create content that was in flagrant um, you know, um, abuse of, of the content moderation policies. And again, the vast majority of, of this content in the form of adverts was accepted on all of these platforms. And for that investigation, we, we tested X as well. And so really our concern is that all of the discrimination that's been spoken about, whether it's along racial lines or nationalist lines, gendered lines or religious lines, um, will be exacerbated um, on and through the use of social media platforms. And it won't be through things that people are, are not familiar with. So where, uh, where identity politics plays a huge role in South Africa and people really align with what they identify with most, whether that be a religious cause or a nationalist or a racial cause, um, politicians and political parties can use those actual issues to divide and polarize people and that can be done on social media through disinformation. Um, and so, so we, we see that happening even with, with with causes that that do matter, um, like the the Israeli-Palestine cause, uh, or, or the Palestine cause and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we see how um, how the polarization between groups of people in South Africa about a global issue is happening through the use of um, fake videos that are being spread over social media, including WhatsApp, misinformation given about who is saying what at what time, um, and this can filter. So it's, it's one thing that political parties can use those issues to polarize people, but then they can also just be upfront misinformation about voting, about where you can vote, about what you need to vote. Like, do you need a, a COVID vaccination certificate? Are you allowed to use your Green Book ID to vote? Um, and it's that sort of thing that's probably going to happen on social media, um, which, which South Africa is lagging behind in terms of having automated systems to detect misinformation and to 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 um you know verify it as inaccurate um in time because the the amount the volume of of disinformation misinformation that is posted on social media is almost impossible to grapple with and and so it really could be like a an arms race of disinformation and, and that could make or break the election an arms race of misinformation disinformation lovely um and and i think just you know for all of us 30 years ago, Rwanda, okay, there wasn't social media, but the usage of radio to spread a particular image, a particular message of a particular group brought about a massacre in a short space of time. Uh, and, and today, the tools are more sophisticated. And when we now go into election, there's going to be much more highly contested. So Janet, I mean, for, for, I know I know the IEC, the remit is 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 fairly broad, but I'm not sure if in 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 the in in, in the ambit of work, sh should parties, assuming we get to advertising, uh, and and they now go into the realm of fake fake information, as well as the kind of of borderline racism and xenophobia. What recourse is there for anybody to challenge that to, to challenge that kind of behavior and content? Your your sound, Janet. Sorry, um, I think that what Kristen said is you know very pertinent because um, just to start off with that, it relates to the absence of adequate. Um, uh, an adequate legislative framework when it comes to dealing um, with the whole realm of, of digital media and digital harms. And, you know, the difficulty with um, that absence means that just for example, when one is um, asking for information, um, I'm saying whether it's civil society, the electoral commission or anybody else, about um, content moderation mechanisms, about risk profiles that 
uh, platforms have developed about um, even information about uh, measures that have been adopted by the platforms in terms of their respective policies and so on and so forth. All of that is something that um, at the moment in the light of our existing legislation is not something that is of right. It is something that has to be fought for and very often that battle will not be won. Just you know, for an example, the, the, it is possible for platforms to indicate when um, AI has been used to generate things, but they're not obliged to do, to do so. So that would be a very basic example of something that would help to give people pause for thought, if not to highlight where um, disinformation has arisen. So what um, Kristen has said is absolutely right. But I think I would say that there are a few things that the Commission um, has been doing and needs to continue doing, I think. Um, the first is that, you know, it's quite important to also have um, an understanding of proactive use of, di of digital media, because to assume that nobody else will occupy the space just doesn't make sense. So people who for example, the commission spends a lot of time engaging on social media and also does have monitoring tools, which I have no doubt don't have um, the kind of level of automation that um, they ought to have, but to track what is going through social media platforms around elections. Now that doesn't mean we'll catch everything and it would be really important for civil society organizations to be sending stuff through on an ongoing basis to the commission so that corrective action can be taken. And the corrective action is in part action of putting out what the, what the accurate um, requirements are and trashing uh, the distortions. I think the second thing is that we have got an agreement um, with the major platforms excluding X. Uh, we had when it was Twitter, but X, as we all know, has got its own um, issues. So with all the major platforms in South Africa, we do have um, basic, uh, you know, a basic agreement, which has a heightened level of both um, monitoring obligations from their side, as well as response, uh, response um, commitments from their side in terms of the election process. And that is um, something that is, as we speak, kicking in a, in, a, in a heightened way. But again, um, I, I'm not suggesting that um, uh, there is th that this um, so that this um, replaces the need for 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 good um, frameworks and and legislative um, constructs. So the second thing is we do have still um, the reporting mechanism that is internal to the IEC, um, working in conjunction with Media Monitoring Africa and SANEF. And, you know, there's a lot of cooperation and increased cooperation that has been built up with various um, uh, experts and civil society organizations, particularly through that structure in order to um, be able to track and correct and um, then have the possibility of engaging platforms. Um, we also uh, have been trying to work increasingly with the Broadcasting Authority and ICASA, but they too have huge challenges. The information regulator, I think, is, is a lot more geared than it has been in 2019, and certainly before it wasn't really um, featuring, uh, to to um, deal with things like micro-targeting, um, where privacy is really compromised. And so there can be reports there, and we work closely with the information regulator. So I think that in terms of preventing harms or mitigating harms, the Commission has been doing that, but there's a lot that civil society can can do to reinforce. The second thing is the electoral code of conduct. 
Now, the code of conduct um, or even a prohibited conduct is something that um, is important, but it needs to be used in a way that people understand. In terms of a court decision, the commission itself cannot um, finalize or adjudicate uh, in any final form anything that constitutes a, a breach in its view of um, the electoral code. The electoral code has to be adjudicated by the constitutional, by the, uh, sorry, the electoral court. And the reason for that is that the court has indicated um, uh, that, and this was in the case in 2019 that pertained to Good and the Democratic Alliance, that the commission, even when it comes to a, a, an instance of fact, which is what was um, what what, what uh, prevailed in that particular case, the commission does not have standing to interpret what is regarded as hate speech, what is regarded. That is something that is within the uh, the purview of the courts. So. There is a really um, important understanding for people to have of the evidence that is required in terms of um, things that form part of the of of the um, conduct that is unacceptable, um, and also I think that there needs to be an understanding also of which is strategically speaking uh, the party that would have the greatest standing. So, for example. If there were um, somebody who was, as um, Kristen has given in her example, spoken about the fact that you need a COVID certificate in order to vote, that would be something that the Electoral Commission has immediate standing to talk about as being, you know, something that is deliberate uh, attempts to, um, uh, you know, hamper and harm the electoral process. If there is, um, if there are processes to um, discredit and give information, as we've had in the past, that if you vote on um, the first day of special voting, it means that any vote cast will go to party X, and if you vote on the second day, it'll go to party Y, and so on. The point is that those are things where the election process is very clearly at the center. But if you have somebody who is, for example, a journalist who is being attacked, not necessarily because what he or she is reporting on the electoral process, but because he or she is not regarded as being sufficiently um, uh, pliant when it comes to listening to nonsense from this or that political uh, contestant, it could be a more speedy way for that person to go in their own right or to be represented even by a media organization, not just to the electoral court, but to the high court as well. So there are certain things that I think just from a, a strategic point of view need to be looked at in terms of um, the electoral code and conduct. Um, then lastly, you know, the issues that I think are really important would be to ensure that um, we we figure out where there are where there's need for greater outreach, where there's need for greater stakeholder engagement, not just in the lead up to the elections, in other words, in the coming weeks, but actually on the days of elections. So where there are problems in voting stations and you have observers, it's important for those observers to have the necessary um, information about where they can report problems um, because they're not going to be able to engage with a presiding officer directly just in terms of the responsibilities of those people. That's just by way of example. Thanks. Thanks, Janet. So, so Kristen and, and, and Zakira, there, there's a fair amount of work that civil society organizations and institutions have to do uh, in terms of countering misinformation, disinformation, dealing with a whole range of discriminatory issues that, that will arise in this election. So Kristen, from, 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 from the work that you've been doing, what is what's in place 
uh, or what will be in place by the time of the elections that you perhaps want to share with us. And then Zakir, I'm going to ask you the same thing. And from both of you, wh who else is doing work and how how are uh, how is all of this work connected? Kristen? Thanks. So I, I think uh, the first thing I'll say is what we hope will be done by the time um, and, and what we're trying to advocate for in, in this period leading up to elections. Um, the main thing that we're asking from and we, we're engaging with social media platforms around this is for them to give us action plans to deal with elections in South Africa in particular. Um, and that means, so, like, like what Janet alluded to, um, something like heightened content moderation during during the election period. Um, it's it's as easy, we understand, as like turning up a dial and saying, okay, focus more on South Africa during this time because they have an election going on at the moment. Um, and, but we, we want action plans that are actually resourced and set out how they are going to specifically direct resources to moderate content coming out of South Africa and related to South Africa's elections at the time. Um, and, and I know that there's this agreement in, in place between the IC and social media platforms, but I, I, I'm not too sure, Janet, whether that's also been made public. And um, I think we, we have requested that, that uh, you know, sight of, of that agreement so we can see what we can call for uh, so that it can actually be strengthened. So we can see where the gaps are and, and make comments on, on where it can actually be strengthened. Um, of course, we, we're not going to get legislation, um, you know, uh, an old legislative framework looking at, at harms perpetuated on social media before election day. Um, and and it's it's hopeful that we that we could get something from the social media platforms. But at the same time, it our engagement with them has shown that that may not be likely as well. And so I think one of the things that we're hoping to achieve um, and which may not be entirely measurable, but but really to educate people about being um, intentional online users um, and and doing the right things online, not just forwarding the WhatsApp message, um, you know, not just liking the post and getting all riled up and sharing it on Facebook, um, but actually reporting where they see something that's untrue, where they see something that's perpetuating hate speech or inciting violence. Um, not only reporting it, but actually using existing tools to, to check whether things are actually accurate. Um, so you asked about what, what tools there are out there already. Um, Media Monitoring Africa has a range of tools available on their website. They have apps that you can download. I think the one is called The Real 411. Um, there's a couple of other, uh, other tools that they are making available during this time where people can actually submit the content that they've seen and then it will go through some sort of process where Media Monitoring Africa can come back and say, this is inaccurate or this is accurate and you can continue posting it. And, and that's a huge thing. Once you see a, a little red, red no sign from Media Monitoring Africa, you know that's not credible content and then you shouldn't share it any further. Um, and so I think that, that's what we really want to want to influence people to do. But but I think we'd, we'd be also um, using this election to to see how things unfold on social media platforms in order to inform our our interventions and our planned interventions uh, leading up to the next election. And then just to say, I think one of the one of the biggest threats we also see, um, which which we saw after the U.S. election and and also again uh, through the use of social media, is contesting the credibility of the election and the, the credibility of the outcome. Um, and I think that's a huge thing. And, and Zakira will talk more about how Defend Our Democracy is, is you know, um, planning to counter that in some way. But I think that's why initiatives like election monitoring and observation are so important, uh, because it will serve as, as a counter to, the, to those sort of claims that are being made. We already have political parties saying that they are going to protest the outcome of the elections. They already already decided that it, that it hasn't gone through a credible process. Um, and so it, it's going to be important for, for accurate information to take center stage on these platforms. And that, that's everyone's responsibility, I think. Zakira, I'm going to ask you to come in, but I'm also going to ask uh, Pumla, who's one of the people in the, who's, who's in, 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 in the meeting here today, perhaps from the previous work in GCIS, whether there's any reflections that she would want to share with us about how to deal with the issues that, that people have, have highlighted here. 
So Zakira civil society, what work's being done? Uh, where are the gaps? How ready are we to deal with the problems that, that might arise in, 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 in this election? So I'll start where Kristen left off on the issue of election observation work. It's really the first time in civil society that there's a coordinated approach to observation work. So previously, organizations would undertake this alone. And through the ele election watch that we are running and a couple of other organizations have their own campaigns that they're running, we're calling for broader groups of organizations to come together to form a kind of watch network that will observe the elections and ultimately be able to collect that information, analyze it, and then pronounce on the integrity of the election. So what this means practically is that different organizations and um, individuals who are linked to organizations will be on the ground on election day at a number of voting stations in different parts of the country. They will then observe what's taking place at voting stations. And it's some of it is the technical processes, you know, did the ballot, uh, were the ballot boxes folded in front of everyone, for example. But then there's the other issues, which is the, the issues of violence and intimidation. Um, what I realized today is that under election observation work, there isn't a specific tab, even um, from previous experience with the, with the IEC monitoring process, for um, you know noting any racial comments specifically or any dis discriminatory comments that are made. And maybe that's something that, that we can look at doing and incorporating. Um, and ultimately, all of this information will be collated, um, and, and civil society, I think, will then have a foot to stand on in order to say whether the elections were free and fair or whether there were issues that were significant enough to hamper the electoral process and the elections itself. So that's the, the thinking for this year. It's quite limited for the moment because of the short space of time. So for this election, um, an election doesn't start and end on election day. It's really the preceding period before an election where there's supposed to be mass observation of issues like social media, what politicians are saying, um, the money that politicians are spending in the lead up to election, as well as the post-electoral period as well. And I think for the, 20, the 2026 and 2029 elections, that's something that, um, that we can perhaps step up on. Um, so our appeal to civil society in this period at, at a very minimum is to register your organization with the IEC, to register with Election Watch so that you have access to the common platform that we're developing and um, get people to observe the elections. That in itself lends towards the, the integrity and credibility of the elections and the transparency of the processes. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that I think civil society organizations need to come out either collectively or individually, but in mass, when comments are made that are racist, for instance, when they are xenophobic by political leaders. Uh, and we've seen, for instance, with MK making particular statements that's hinting at violence or intimidation at the IEC. Um, there were just a few civil society organizations that came out and, and spoke about this, but it really required a, a more collective approach to, to almost defending the, the integrity and the work of the IEC up to now. And calling out the kind of violence and, and intimidation that I think was being hinted at in some of those statements. And the same apply, uh, I think applies in instances of discrimination, um, racism, et cetera, um, if, if political leaders make those statements. The third thing um, for me is to support the work of other organizations. So to support the work of, of the Legal Resources Center, support the work of uh, Media Monitoring Africa, Africa Check is doing fantastic work evaluating what political party statements were previously, what promises they have made, um, as well as, um, you know, they often have a fake news stamp that they put on certain pieces of information that come out. And I think that's something that we can look out for in this election period as well. It does require um, from organizations who have tech expertise and social media expertise, the ability to monitor and give public commentary on analysis on their findings. So those who do media monitoring and analysis, uh, organizations like CABC, for instance, we've previously done work on xenophobia and the impact of social media narratives in relation to it, I think have a role to play in this election. There are three things for me that's really lacking and that we need to improve on for future elections. One is the use of AI. Um, so historically in South Africa, we've had experience with Bell Pottinger and we've had experiences 
with the July 2021 unrest. It's made us a little bit cautious on social media. But just about a couple of weeks ago with the, with the Pakistan elections that took place, you would have seen post-elections an AI-generated speech by Imran Khan. So it was a kind of victory speech. He's in prison. He, he didn't say a word of it. He probably got out the message, but it was generated in his voice. And it sounded exactly like him. Um, and it was aired on Al Jazeera as his victory speech with a small note saying that it was from AI. But if you look at the type of content that AI is able to generate, and um, I've recently read about scientific journals that have accepted AI written pieces in you know very respected journals and it appear, appears worth like the random things that AI is saying this piece would have probably gone through, through numerous editorial checks but still gets published um you know with, with all of the mistakes in it as is and I think that that is quite a cause for concern the, the sorry the second issue that I think we need to look at and I don't know Janet if it is possible for this elections is that the electoral code of conduct doesn't make any specific reference to issues of hate, even if it links it to just the constitutional uh, values or the, you know, the way the constitution spells it out. But it speaks about uh, intimidation, it speaks about violence, it speaks about stealing other political party logos, but nothing to do with racial discrimination directly. And maybe that, that's something that could be considered. And then the last thing is that I think we need to look very closely at international examples. Because for me, the danger is not only about racial narratives and what it may do in an election period, but it's about those racial narratives being accepted by people, being uh, popularized, and being taken as an interpretation of the, the reality so that they vote in right-wing parties. And we've seen this recently, for example, in Portugal, where you have a, a far-right party that's now kingmaker, previously had 12 seats is just five years old and now has 48 seats in, in the National Assembly or Parliament. And um, when a party like that comes into power, they then have the potential to change policies later on. So if you look at the example of India, you have Modi coming into, into power, um, popularizing his electoral messaging um, in, in ways that um, I think in India are quite dangerous. And once he comes into power, is then able to put forward, uh, you know, citizenship laws in in different regions that then discriminate um, or advantage particular groupings of people, and that I think is the long term danger rather than just the immediate danger of the immediate electoral period. Thanks. Thanks, Akira. Uh, Umla, I, I know I've uh, I'm just bringing this on to you. But given the role that you played in GCIS, and you've probably seen this through uh, at, 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 during electoral periods, what 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 what's your kind of advice on how to deal with the warning signals that I think all the speakers have alluded to here? Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Even though I don't like to rule from the grave. Uh, from from the GCIS period, but I will share some. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm saying that uh, I think I will give some snippets of what I can still remember, but I just wanted to give some other input. I think the, the, the recollection that I would also make reference to is the, was the local government at the time when I was still there and also during the COVID. And I think that's the time when the, the social media was the biggest nightmare uh, for us. And I think how we had to think very quickly to involve the fact, fact, fact check, I think fact check, came to our rescue, but even when they came through our rescue, I think this environment is moving very fast and turning around the information that is wrong and correcting it. Two hours later, another account has been created and it, 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 it just was going on and on, but I think we were trying to manage it as best as we can using the real 411 and fact check 
particularly for the local government and the, the, the COVID campaign, which was also one of the biggest misinformation terrain. But the point I wanted to, to reflect on, even not for this election, but going forward, you know, I think for me, it, it, it becomes extremely difficult to start expecting the political leaders to tone down their rhetoric when it is campaigning time. I think there has to be some kind of an acknowledgement that we are not consistent in dealing with racial discriminatory utterances as we continue as a country. Take, for example, Dudula. I mean, when Dudula was coming in, I was at pains in trying to get the security cluster to get involved. And I mean, the, the, the kind of response you were getting, no, no, we are aware, we're just monitoring them. I don't think the issue was that they were banning buildings or whatever. Tackling the issues that are in conflict with the constitution of the country, we've been very, very sleepy and we continue to be sleepy. When Malema was uttering all those racial drivel, we were actually quite happy to say, I know she's talking nonsense and not dealing with it. So I think we can expect that it's going to be different now. I mean, even with Mackenzie's nonsense, it's not gonna be different now. They will continue. If you just look at social media now, and I think Kristen is correct, the attacks that they are putting on, on journalists, I haven't seen a statement from government condemning that kind of an, an attack. So I think going forward, we do need to have a deeper discussion, particularly on, on the structures of government that is this constitution your constitution that you have to live by, not just on a human rights day, you reflect on it. You don't leave it and you don't continue to deal with it. So I thought I wanted to, to make that reference to say, we may not succeed now, but I think going forward, I think the racial discrimination in this country is not dealt with decisively so that we avoid this kind of rhetoric and populist utterances by political uh, figures who, and most of it, it resonates in some of the communities that are, are struggling and they find foreigners being an issue because nobody is, is contextualizing it. Thanks, Sean. No, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, Rector Bile, as the convener of this meeting, uh, do you want to just raise uh, from your angle of work the issue that you want all of the speakers to respond to as they make their closing remarks. No, Mr. Bolton, I think the speakers have been quite comprehensive in, in explaining not only from what's happening realistically on the ground, but also what's happening on social media. <laughs> so you have put me on the spot, but I think I'm quite covered. Thank you very much. No, thank you. So, so Kristen Zakira, I think you know, I, I was I was just asking myself, if if I were to see anything that I thought was 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 that I needed to report in this election period, I, I if you hadn't spoken about media monitoring Africa and some of their tools, I, I wouldn't have known about this. Is there work being done anywhere that packages the uh, uh, kind of of, of set of tools on information on what to do for specific kinds of issues and who to report it and where. And, and perhaps Janet will conclude in terms of what what's the reporting mechanisms in the IEC as we close. Kristen? I don't know if there's a, a comprehensive package that, that, that says what everybody's doing, but that would be useful. Um, I, I would direct people to, to Media Monitoring Africa's website and look, take a look at the tools. I know that the Social Justice Assembly has also put together a number of tools. One is um, like a, a workbook sort of toolkit thing that can be used in communities. Um, and there's a second thing, which is a, a bot. And I would be lying if I said I know exactly what the bot does, but I think you can ask it questions. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the what the scope of the bot is, um, but but they also I think they sent out I just saw an email with 
the range of tools that they have and that you that the public can access. So I, I would maybe just direct people to those two to those two resources that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, media monitoring Africa Good. and social justice assembly. Sakira, from your side. I don't know of any other tools. I think from DOD side, um, if there is a a set of of websites that we could direct people to, we'd be able to circulate that to a wider base of civil society organizations. And I think that um, other organizations can perhaps also popularize this on their own social media sites and to their own databases as well. Um, from DOD side, I think that the focus for now is really on the election observation work. And we'll take from this meeting, I think the call around um, specifying issues of discrimination and making sure that that's part of the observation process as well. Um, but beyond that, I think that um, there's just a, a general, I think, a broader lack of understanding of the cumulative risks to elect electoral processes in this country more broadly. So I don't think there's even as yet a common risk assessment by civil society organizations on the threat to, to the elections. And that's particularly in light of some of the narratives that we've seen in the last couple of weeks. So I think that that work still has to be done. And I know that um, we are very fast running out of time, but organizations need to do the best that they can in this next period. Yeah, no, no, as I, I hear you, uh, but from the couple of hundred parties that have registered for the elections, there's perhaps one, if not two, who have been making those kinds of utterances. My sense is that the sheer number of parties contesting the elections is, is one of the biggest guarantors for its own safety, because they all have an interest in the outcome. Uh, is not in their interest for the elections to be disrupted and what have you. There might be disputes thereafter, but I'm not minimizing the, the dangers that you have alluded to, uh, but but not let's not also uh, make it bigger than, than, than what it perhaps is at, at the moment. Um, I do think there's a need for a consolidated set of information and, and one area where people can, 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 I can find this and maybe between yourselves, Kirsten, Zakira, and other institutions who would be able to work on that kind of stuff. Janet, closing remarks from you and also gratitude for, you, for your presence here today. Um, well, first of all, when it comes to um, equipping um, different uh, members of civil society organizations with tools, to um, be vigilant, to detect, to uh, be using a, a social media in a way that is um, sufficiently um, well equipped. We've worked most closely with SANEF and Media Monitoring Africa. And I think that there is not just a toolkit that they themselves have developed, but there are, they also have insight into. Um, the different um, uh, policy uh, policies and and reporting platform reporting mechanisms of the different platforms. So I think that it would be possible for um, DoD and others to get a kind of um, a clarity of you know that could be in a, in a much shorter. Um, in in a short document circulated and maybe also um, looked at from the point of view of equipping people. But when it comes to reporting, I think that the reporting of um, any level of distortion, disinformation, misinformation, the platform that is is active at the at this moment and becomes very um, uh, focused on electoral related things is the four one, real 411 platform. And so that is a reporting tool. It means that things that come into that um, structure will not only be looked at for purposes of fact checking and, and all the rest of it, but will also, to the extent that there's need for correction, the um, cooperation between ourselves and through that platform 
means that it will come immediately to our staff who are dealing with social media, who will then be able to submit corrective information. So that would be to, to you know, on the in terms of social media. What I would suggest is that um, for the purposes of um, domestic observation, and I think it would be valuable for uh, the the a request to be submitted in the in the near future for an for an email address where concerns that are. Um, one or more email address, I'm not suggesting one, where concerns relating, for example, to things that are happening not necessarily in a voting station, but around a voting station, such as violence and, and so on and so forth, can be reported so that, you know, there can be an alert issued. But that has to be done in a manner that is, you know, that 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 also tracks the origin of those reports because a lot of mischief can be done sending people from pillar to post um, by people who are not sincerely wanting to um, to promote a, a good electoral process. But I think it's worthwhile engaging with the Commission on how those reports, whether it's at regional level, provincial level, or national level, can be issued. Every results center, so we have the nine provincial centers and the national center, has what we call um, a, 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 um, an area where every kind of problem that can exist from logistics to other problems get reported into. So it becomes quite important to have a way in, in which those reports are received Clearly for observers, and this will be, um, I think has already been part of what is understood, but observers are really there to only give alerts when it's something that, you, I mean, most of the time observation is not going to have the same weight as um, party agents. I think many people who, have been, who are observers um, have also spent time being party agents. And in the role of a party agent, you've got a far more robust role to represent um, the interests of the particular contestant that you're dealing with. An observer has one step removed role, which is really to look at systemic issues, particularly, obviously, if there's urgent systemic issues, to raise them urgently. But for the rest, to be able to um, give insights for improvement um, you know, of the process as a whole, as well as to give um, uh, comment and to give um, uh, feedback on the freeness and fairness of the election overall. But in that, um, I think a very important role has been highlighted here, and it is to do with issues of conduct. Because um, although very often we assume that contesting, competing um, parties and individuals will be the watch, the, 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 the guarding, will guard one another, will watch one another, will report one another. Very often um, they don't, uh, partly because they, um, uh, you know, I, I, th there isn't a kind of consciousness that there needs to be about proper conduct. But in the conduct, uh, the code of conduct, I just wanted to deal with that. Um, there is a commitment that requires any contestant to publicly condemn any action that may undermine free and fair elections. Now, civil society needs to start defining through court action, what does that consist of? Okay, I'm using that as one example. Secondly, in the code of conduct, um, one of the areas of prohibited conduct in the code is the use of language or action that in any way can provoke violence or intimidate candidates, parties, or supporters of parties or voters. Again, what does that consist of and where will the courts draw the line between intimidation and free speech? Between, in, okay, and that is something, it's like hate speech. 
to put hate speech in a document doesn't really take us anywhere because as we know it's something that needs to have jurisprudence to define what are the boundaries and what are the limits in order to also protect free speech importantly the code very specifically um, indicates that no party or candidate may discriminate on the grounds of race ethnicity sex gender class religion in connection with an election or any political activity so again and this is where you know it becomes important to think about from a strategic point of view and in terms of getting us to become better as we go forward to actually get the jurisprudence to be put on the statute books because otherwise we are we are shadow boxing and i think that that um uh, is is really important there are other issues about vote buying or offering an inducement or reward and displaying weapons and so on some of those have been adjudicated in the past but it's important that we keep that as part of the live strategy um going forward um yeah those would be my 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 parting thought and and thank you very much i know that um you know this is the kind of uh um before a public holiday which people have already converted into a long weekend and then there are fasts and 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 necessary um time for for being able to break fast so this is a difficult time to call this but it's an important conversation so thanks to you guys for organizing th th thanks to all of you um and and thanks to Reta Bile, our, our anti-racism program manager, for pulling all of this together and the team. Um, and, and and I'm sure that that as the content of this is shared much more widely, people will begin to, uh, to to extract the areas of importance that that have been highlighted here. So thanks to all of you. Good night, Sakira. You can now go and eat. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.